Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to Blind Injustice with Donya Lee Drinks. I'm Donya Lee, and this is my drink. Today, we're having a cheap ass screw top pinot. So, those of you who are Swifties will get that reference. If you're not, that's okay. You can stay anyway. Well, Happy New Year. Yes, I know, January is almost over and I'm a little late in the game um, getting started this year. And I was pretty bad wrapping up last year as well and I do apologize. There were holidays and life and got some new equipment so hopefully these videos will look and sound a little better. Um, so that that's all my excuses, that's all I got. But I'm hoping going forward this year, I will get these out to you much more frequently and regularly because honestly, we've got some work to do and we're going to talk about that. Um, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Janya. I'm an RN and I'm also a certified legal nurse consultant, which gives me a foot in both the legal and medical worlds, which I really love. If you're not familiar with the Innocence Project, I encourage you to go back to my first video um, and that will let you know a little bit about them, what they do, about me, who I am, why I'm so passionate about them, and some scary statistics about your justice system that will keep you up at night. On this channel, we talk about cases of the unjustly incarcerated, people who were actually innocent, but were put away for sometimes many, many years. Um, and then were freed by the Innocence Project through DNA evidence. We talk about those who were incarcerated and have been freed. And this year, I'm gonna spend some more time on those who are currently still in prison and um, even though DNA evidence has already freed them, they are still incarcerated. I wanna talk about those cases because there's some things that you can do to help and I think that's important. We will also talk about cases where somebody was only posthumously cleared, which means they were subject to the death sentence and only after they passed away did we find out that they were actually innocent. So. If this sounds like a subject that interests you and you'd like to get more involved, grab whatever you're drinking and let's get started. Robert McClendon was one of three sons who was being raised by a single mother who struggled with addiction. Robert had a real problem with that, so as he got older in his teen years, they just kind of um, started clashing a lot and he went to live with his aunt while he finished high school. He was a really good student. He got really good grades. He was a great kid as well, super charismatic. Everybody in the neighborhood and in the community really loved him as he was growing up. Unfortunately, as we see often in marginalized communities, once he finished high school, there were really no real options for him. He had not really gotten any guidance as far as next steps to take and how to become a productive member of society. So he did what many young men did there after they finished high school. He sold drugs. Now, because of his mom, he never took drugs himself. And because of that, he was actually the most successful drug dealer in his neighborhood. Not that that's anything to be super proud of, but he did, um, he was on the up and up and he did really well for himself. He, uh, like I said, was very charming, charismatic. Everybody loved him. And since he did not use the drugs he was selling and making money from, he was quite successful at what he did. When he was 19, he got himself in a bit of hot water. He was dating a 15 year old. His, um, sorry, her parents found out about it and turned him in. He was charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. He was not charged with statutory rape, and that's great, but this charge, even the contributing to the delinquency of a minor, and the fact that she was 15, later would come back to haunt him in a really big way. By the time he was in his 20s, he had three children by three different women. He had a boy and two girls. He was living with his youngest daughter's mother, um, and she was about five years old. But something big went down between them 
Um, I was not able to find out exactly what it was, but it caused a lot of anger and bitterness on both sides. Um, he handled it much better than she did, which we'll see later down the road. But he, like I said, his youngest daughter was five when they parted and he ended up leaving his youngest daughter's mother. Because of the way they parted, the child's mother refused to allow him to see his daughter, so he didn't know her at all. Shortly after he left his child's mother, he ended up getting arrested for dealing drugs. He appeared in front of a Judge Johnson who really seemed to take a liking to McClendon. Like I said, he was a charming and charismatic. He was a good guy. He was just making a living doing a bad thing, but he was a good man. And the judge took a liking to him and he didn't get any um, jail time for dealing drugs. He was just placed on parole. A few years later, at the end of April in 1990, he was walking down the street. He was going to visit a friend of his and a young girl approached him. She looked to be about 10 years old. And she said, um, excuse me, are you Robert McClendon? And he said, yes, I am. Who are you? And she said, well, I think you're my daddy. And like I said, by now she was 10. He hadn't seen her in five years, so there was really no way he could have recognized her, right? He asked her how she knew it was him, and she said she had seen some pictures of him around the house, and they talked very briefly. He said to tell her mother hello, and that was it. It was a very brief exchange. She went on her way, he went on his way. That was the end of it. Now, later that afternoon, the police were called. They were called by this child's mother who said that she had found her daughter walking and acting strangely and confronted her and asked her what happened. And the girl stated that she had been kidnapped and sexually assaulted and she needed the police to come. So the police come and question the little girl and she said she'd been playing in the backyard and a man pulled her over the back fence, put a sock around her eyes, tied a sock around her eyes, and placed her in a car. He then pulled up to an old abandoned house, brought her in the house, and sexually assaulted her on an old couch in this old abandoned house. She said she really didn't see much, but after he was done, he then put her back in the car, and she wasn't sure where they were going when they all of a sudden stopped, and she heard him get out of the car. So she pulled the sock from her eyes, realized kind of where she was in the neighborhood, and ran home. When they asked her if she knew who had done this, she said, I think it was my daddy, but I can't be sure because I had a sock over my eyes. They take her to the hospital and they do a rape exam. They stated to the mom that they can see signs of physical assault, but stated there was no semen available to test for DNA. So they collected the swabs, they collected her underwear to store as evidence, but stated they were not gonna test, to do any further testing because they found nothing to test. So in May of 1990, Robert McClendon is charged with rape. Once again, he is in front of Judge Johnson, who doesn't believe that he could have done this. He lets him out on only a thousand dollars bond pending trial. While he was waiting for trial, he was driving around running some errands and he's got this bright red, beautiful Mercedes that he was tooling around town in and he gets pulled over by this cop. Now this officer is named Officer Odell and he would end up later being found out to be a really crooked cop, which we'll find out in a second, we, we know that he is. But he was pissed. He didn't like Robert McClendon to begin with because he knew he was a big drug dealer in town, yet everybody seemed to like him and that really pissed him off. So when he found out that he had raped a child and was out, allegedly raped a child, it wasn't allegedly an officer Odell's mind, and was out on a thousand dollar bond, he was really angry. So he pulls McClendon over and he walks over to McClendon's car and waves three different baggies of drugs in his hand and proceeds them proceeds to plant them in his car in front of him and then arrests him for possession and takes him in. Now, McClendon, this guy has a much better sense of humor than I do because he was giving an interview after his exoneration and he was kind of laughing about this arrest because he said any drug dealer worth his salt knows you do not deal drugs in your prize car. 
you have a dealer car, which is an old piece of junk that you do your dealing in. That way, if you get pulled over and you do have drugs on you, they impound the piece of junk car. You don't ever deal in your prize car because it will get impounded. And he said everybody knew this and he found that kind of funny. Um, and like I said, he's got a much better sense of humor than I would, considering everything that has happened to him. McClendon would waive his right to a jury trial. He and his public defender both agreed that there was too much emotion in the case to be trusted with a jury. Um, juries tend to think a lot with their heart, not necessarily with their head in the law, and this little girl was going to be brought to testify. So they thought it would be better to go in front of a judge. Well, lo and behold, this judge that hears the case is, guess who? It's Judge Johnson. Now, we're gonna back up just a little bit. The prosecution didn't even want to try this case. Number one, you've got a child witness, and that's not always reliable, but it's always emotional. And number two, this guy, even though he's a drug dealer, was very well liked around town. So they're gathering evidence about this rape and they're not really coming up with a whole lot besides her statement. Nobody saw them, there's no witnesses. He's got alibis. Because remember I said that afternoon he was walking to a friend's house? Well, he and that friend were around town all day running errands. Multiple people saw them. So he had, a, he had an alibi for the time of that crime. So things aren't really looking good for the prosecution. They don't even want to try the case. So they give him a lie detector to see if they can get any leverage there to help. And he passes the lie detector test. So guess what they do? They give him a second one and a third one. And finally, the fourth one, by the fourth one, he's so frazzled and he's tired and worn out and scared and anxious. And the fourth polygraph is inconclusive. Now, inconclusive doesn't mean guilty. It doesn't mean not guilty, but it doesn't mean guilty. But it's just enough different from those past polygraph tests that the fourth polygraph is the one that they bring to court. Now, like I said, he has a public defender who is not awesome at his job or has too many cases, whatever the case may be. But this public defender does not bring any alibis up to testify on his behalf, does not introduce the other three polygraphs as evidence, and does not explain to the judge, which I'm sure the judge has this knowledge, but he can't make his decision based on his own knowledge, he has to make his decision based on the facts that are brought before him in the case. And one of the facts that's missing from that is what an inconclusive polygraph means. It just means that you need to do the polygraph over. It doesn't mean guilt, it doesn't mean innocence, it just means there was some kind of interference in that polygraph and it needs to be done over again. But his attorney does not mention any of these things at all. So. That's the sum total of his defense. So then his daughter gets up to testify and it's extremely emotional. The mother is crying, the little girl is crying and she gives some kind of shaky testimony as to what happened to her that day. And she gives the same testimony that she had given the police. Playing in the backyard, somebody pulled her over the fence, she went to this abandoned house on the couch got away at the convenience store. But again, under testimony, she does say, I think it was my daddy, but I can't say for sure because I was blindfolded. So she does say that on the stand. That testimony pretty much seals the deal for him because he's not only got this emotional child's testimony, he's also got that prior conviction for having a relationship with a 15 year old. So those two things kind of are the final two nails in his coffin. And Judge Johnson takes a look at him and says, I'm sorry, son, I, I think you did this. And he's like, Judge, I did not rape my own daughter. I was somewhere else that day. I have witnesses that can testify to that, but by now it's already over, right? Because the defense rested. And Judge Johnson just wasn't believing in him anymore. And again, he apologized and said, I'm sorry, son, 
I really believe you did this. So on August 28, 1991, he sentences him to 15 years to life in prison. And I get the feeling that Judge Johnson really didn't want to believe that he had done this, but between the little girl's testimony and his own inadequate defense, I don't think he really felt like he had a choice and it's a serious crime. So McClendon goes to prison. While he's in prison, he gets his GED. And I have to say, I think everything I've read about who this guy is, is true because he has committed a child sex crime, right? So he should be on the lowest of the low as far as prisoners go. He should be getting the snot kicked out of him on the daily, but he doesn't. This is what happens with McClendon. So he gets his GED and he decides, he's a pretty good basketball player. Also, that's just a side note, but it's relevant here. Um, he starts challenging inmates to basketball games with the wager that if they lose, they have to get their GED as well. By the time McClendon was exonerated, 21 inmates had gotten their GED because they lost basketball games to Robert McClendon. Now oh, that's a pretty good use of prison time. And I have to say, you know, we've heard a lot of these cases now and so many of these men and women really make amazing use of their time in prison. And I admire that so much because as much as I'd like to believe that I would be spending my days in the law library, helping my own case, helping prisoners learn to read, write, how to research their own case, I'd love to think that I would be that person. But I also know the other side of myself that would probably be the one curled up in a fetal position in the bed, in the cell, until it was time for me to be released or die. I think I would just be frozen in anger at the fact that I'm in here for the rest of my life for something I didn't do. I would just want to sleep it away. So I have so much admiration for these people who make really good use of their time when they're not even supposed to be there to begin with. So he helps these men get their GED and he also does some work on his own case. So once DNA evidence is more of a thing, like I told you, the, the hospital knew to save those swabs for testing even though they said there wasn't anything to test, but DNA wasn't as big then. But as DNA is becoming more popular, Robert reads about it and he wants to try to get the evidence in his case tested. Well, he finds out like in a lot of our cases, the swabs have been destroyed, the rape kit's been lost or stolen or whatever. So there's nothing to test. And plus they said there had been no semen found on it, so there wasn't anything to test anyway. But McClendon being who he is, doesn't stop there. He files a motion with the state instead. So this is the county prosecutor's office and they have denied him. So now he's gonna to go to the state and he never hears back from the state at all. Now, after his exoneration, the judge that should have been the one to respond to him made an official apology to him, said, son, I don't know what happened. I don't know if we didn't get your letter or if we got it and it got lost with other letters, but I am so sorry that we never responded to you. So he's writing, to the state, I'm sure more than once, and he doesn't hear back from anyone. We need a better system. So in 2007, he starts um, writing to the Ohio Innocence Project and they get involved. And what, you know how this is, we've seen it again and again. Once they get involved, all of a sudden evidence that was gone suddenly reappears, right? So they're able to get the kit and the victim's underwear and they send it off for testing and guess what? There is semen on the underwear and it can be tested and there is a DNA profile and it's not Robert McClendon's. Shocker. Yeah, you only think that's a shocker. You have not seen anything yet. What I did like about this case is in other cases, we've seen that the DNA comes back and they just sit in prison for months before they go. But as soon as, it took about three months for the DNA to come back. And once it came back, he was exonerated and released immediately. 
So this poor man has lost almost 20 years of his life at this point to a child's shaky testimony and no other witnesses. Oh, and let's not forget the inconclusive polygraph. So he lost 20 years of his life based on those three things, and it was never him. He had about 50 family members, friends, and people in the community waiting for him when he got out. And they went and took him to dinner. He had pizza and wings from his favorite places, um, and they had a big party for him. They reached out to his daughter for comment on his exoneration and the DNA evidence not being his, but she refused to comment. And we're gonna know why that is in just a minute. In 2010, he was awarded $1.1 million by the state, and in 2012, he was given another $200,000 from the city. This comes out to about $60,000 per year of incarceration, and it's the most generous of settlements we've seen so far, but I just don't think there's any amount of money that can buy justice. And we always like to know what these guys are doing now, right? Well, I'm sure it will not surprise you with um, the personality he seems to have and the kind of character he seems to have. He is involved with the Innocence Project. He is involved in the reassimilating programs because these prisoners that spend, you know, 20 plus years in prison, look at how fast our world changes, especially in the form of technology. So he helps them reassimilate, teaches them how to use the internet, how to find a job, things like that. Um, so that's what he does now. When Robert was first released from prison, his first words were, hello, truth. And now he has those printed on t-shirts that he gives the exonerees that he helps when they are released from prison. And also, like in our other cases, we always like to know who the real perpetrator is, right? So after McClendon was exonerated, um, his Innocence Project attorney got curious about running that DNA sample against CODIS. They knew it wasn't McClendon's, but why not? Let's see who it is. Yeah, I'm gonna need you guys to hold on to your seats because I still cannot wrap my mind around who this is and how this went down. So, hold on and grab your drink tight. Everything now. A year after his exoneration, his Innocence Project ran the DNA against CODIS and there was a hit. It was the victim's older half-brother. It gets so much worse than this. At the time of her assault, the victim was 10 and her half-brother was 17. They had different fathers, but they lived with and shared the same mother. Not only did he assault her when she was 10, but they would go on to have a mutually consenting relationship throughout their teens and into adulthood. That's still not the worst of it with their mother's knowledge. Let's think about what this means exactly. This means that at some point, the mother either walked in on a situation she wasn't supposed to or found out, whatever the case may be. So the mother finds out that her 10-year-old daughter and her 17-year-old son are having a sexual relationship. Not only does she do nothing to stop it, she has an opportunity to protect her son and get back at her ex for whatever it is she's so pissed off at him about. So she knowingly and willfully convinces this little girl to pin it on her father instead of her brother. Now, I don't know if the daughter coming home that day and mentioning him and saying that he said to say hi ripped off a scab or it lit some kind of fire under her because she sent this man to prison for 20 years because her own son and her daughter 
were having a sexual relationship at 10 and 17. That's what this means. Now, when I first started reading this case before I knew this piece and she named her father, I kind of could see how that would happen. She hasn't seen him in five years. She runs into him and then this really traumatic thing that we think happened to her, because we think it happened to her, that we think happened to her and she names her dad. I could see that she's only 10 and she had just seen him and I could see how maybe this traumatically just imprinted on her. That was her dad so i could kind of see how that would happen um, and i think her father would have been able to understand that as well i think everybody was really understanding about that when he was first exonerated but that's not what happened what happened is this mother knew from the jump that her son was assaulting her daughter and she pins it on her ex and convinces her daughter to pin it on her and in his words, they let me rot in prison for 20 years. There were three people who knew he was innocent and they left him there. Not only that, but this woman continued to feed her daughter to her son. So much so that they ended up having a consensual relationship through their teens and through into adulthood. McClendon stated that he did have empathy for his daughter this whole time before he had this extra bit of information. He said it just added such a layer of evil over it that he could not get past it and he does not forgive any of them. <laughs> I certainly don't blame him. Evil, evil, evil. Now in her defense, she was clearly groomed from a very young age because even though that relationship would be consensual later, once she was old enough to give consent, it had started at a time that she wasn't able to give consent. So she was very much groomed by not just her brother, but apparently her mother too, who knew this was going on and either turning a blind eye to it or God forbid, supporting it. And of course, we don't really know exactly how all of this played out, but there we do know there was never a kidnapping there was never a car, there was never a house, a couch, or a convenience store. None of that ever happened. My guess, if I had to just write a script as how, to how this all played out, my guess is the mom came home at a time they weren't expecting her to come home, walked in on something she wasn't supposed to, saw an opportunity, like I said, to protect her son and throw this man away. That's what I think happened. But like I said, what goes deeper for me is that she just continued to allow them to be in the same home together, allow them to have a relationship. You can't tell me she didn't know what was going on. They had a relationship for years and years and years. She knew what was going on and she allowed it. I can't begin to fathom that. This lady gives Joan Crawford a run for her money. No wire hangers ever! And unfortunately, even if the state wanted to, they could not prosecute the brother any longer. The statute of limitations ran out the year McClendon was exonerated. So the statute of limitations for this crime in this state is 12 years after their 18th birthday, which is pretty generous considering um, what the statute of limitations is in other states. It's usually pretty conservative. But so they had 12 years after her 18th birthday, either for her or the state to press charges. And that was about three months before the CODIS results came back. So now these little half sibs get to live their twisted little life with their twisted mother and live twisted ever after. Kind of reminds me of Flowers in the Attic. Flowers in the Attic is not a love story to aspire to. I am not trying to make light of this situation at all. It is absolutely horrific for everyone involved, for that poor little girl, for McClendon, even for the perpetrator, the brother, who was basically given freedom thinking that this has some kind of normalcy to it, 
since the mother is, if not supporting, then at least turning an eye away, it, it's horrible for everybody. And even for the mom to carry that kind of anger with her her whole life that she would do something like this, nobody wins here. Nobody. But sometimes I have to use a little levity to keep from eating a bullet because our justice system is so effed. And I will tell you, sometimes it feels utterly hopeless. The policies and procedures that we have in place, the amount of red tape that it takes to get through all that, to even try to change anything, just to be rejected by this political party, and then we change presidents and we get a chance to do it from this political party, but then it's time for another election again, so all of it gets canceled by this polit I mean, it's stupid. There's Justice is not involved in any of that, and everybody loses, and it feels really hard. But I have to remember that it's not hopeless. Because if we start taking that stand, things will never change. We all owe it to humanity to do our part to try to make the world a better place. And this channel is me trying to do my part. Innocent until proven guilty? I don't think so. That's all for today, kids. Don't forget to go back and catch up on any episodes that you might have missed. And speaking of doing your part, if you would like to know how you can do your part, here's one of the things that you can do and one of the things that I have done. Um, if you've watched me before, you've seen me mention this, I mention it at the end of every video because it's really important and it's just a small step that we all can take. You know those DNA services like 23andMe? I know there are some other ones too, but that's the one I use, so that's the one that's always stuck in my brain. So I did that and it was really fun. I just spit a lot in a little tube, sent it in, and it took a little while. But um, when my profile came back, it was really interesting because a lot of the things that I had going on physically and even some things that I had going on mentally made a lot of sense to me. There were some markers that I had where I was predisposed to a lot of these things and it will even tell you markers that you have that you need to go get further testing done in order to prevent things from happening in the future. So even just from a wellness standpoint, it's a great idea. But then you can take it one step further. There is an organization called GEDmatch, and they are an organization that does what's called genetic genealogy. And here's what that means. Let's say, like, my cousin's cousin's cousin commits a crime and they get a DNA profile on them, but there's no match in the computer. What they will find is a partial match to me because we share some DNA, right? So then they will come to me and say, hey, you're a partial match on somebody. Can we take a look at your family tree and see who might be involved in this crime? And so then I tell them who all my relatives are and we go down this family tree and then they wait for people to throw away a soda can or something, take cigarette butt, whatever, take their DNA, and that they've solved a lot of crimes this way. It's a relatively new branch of forensic testing, but it's accurate. My partial match is not accurate, of course, because it's not me. But as they trace these trees down, they do it until they get a full DNA match, and then crime solved, right? I don't want to be throwing relatives under the bus or anything, but if they do something like commit a crime, that's on them, not on me. And if I can help get one more innocent person out by putting the guilty party in, then I'm willing to do that too. So I have links below in the description to 23andMe, to the Innocence Project, so you can get more information there, and to Jed Batch if you're interested in doing something like that. And I hope you're not related to Norman Bates either, but if we are, we need to do our part and put them away. And as always, I'm also a proud donor to the Innocence Project. DNA testing is extremely expensive and they count on donations. They are a nonprofit. They count on donations to pay these attorneys to do all this testing. Um, Court system is expensive, attorneys cost money, DNA tests cost money, and if you're looking for a better tax break this year than you got last year, 
I just gave you one more place where you can donate some money. I know that they would appreciate it. And if you've watched this channel for any length of time, God knows they can use all the help they can get. Am I right? Until next time, be kind, don't be a Karen, and stay in your lane. Love you. See you next time. Bye.